Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, so welcome to the monthly PE Grand Rounds so webinar that's supported through the University of Michigan. And today we have a very interesting topic and a very distinguished panel of experts to talk about CTO or chronic total occlusions in the pulmonary arteries. You know, it's a, it's a new frontier and we are hoping to show some cases and learn from each other. Uh, so I we have Dr. Yulanka Castro. She's on faculty in interventional cardiology at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. We have Zachary Steinberg, who is a faculty and a pulmonary angioplasty operator at University of Washington in Seattle. And we have Dr. Jabber, who's uh, an interventional cardiologist, as well as uh, a pulmonary embolism and pulmonary angioplasty expert from Emory University Hospital. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we don't have any support or funding from any industry source. So this is completely free of any of those conflicts. And Dr. Sethi just joined in from, from Columbia University in New York, which is also wonderful. Dr. Sethi is an interventional cardiologist uh, who has a special interest in pulmonary embolism and pulmonary angioplasty as well. So with no further ado, I will show the QR code for the CME credit at the end of the session. I'm going to let Dr. Steinberg share his screen and show us the case that he wants to show us to about. Sure, great. You want me to take it away from here? I'll keep an eye on the chat box and, and you know, so, so, so try to keep an eye on the questions. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, I don't know if the, the attendees or anyone uh, has the ability to turn on their microphone, but please feel free to jump in at any point. Uh, my presentation really should be kind of a practical approach. This is how, this is one case in how I approached it. Um, and I include some of the methods that I've been using to get at these vessels. This is probably my most challenging CTO to date. I may qualify that a little bit, maybe my second most challenging to date. Recent patient um, and interesting. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and dive right in. It's a 28-year-old woman. She comes with an extensive past medical history. Uh, and that includes, in 2014, she was diagnosed with tricuspid valve endocarditis. This was MSSA. This was related to her IV drug use. Uh, she had severe sepsis complicating this presentation and multiple septic emboli uh, to the lungs. This was treated medically, and it's unclear to me whether or not she failed medical therapy or she had recidivism of her IV drug use, but she had a recurrent bout of tricuspid endocarditis in 2015, um, several months later. Uh, at that point, she really manifested severe TR. She had additional septic emboli to the lung and uh, had a persistent right-sided air leak as a result. And she underwent implantation of multiple bronchial valves. And then she was brought forward in the same hospitalization for surgical tricuspid valve replacement. She had a 25 millimeter bioprosthesis placed and she underwent electrocautery of the necrotic right and middle, uh, excuse me, necrotic right middle and lower lobes. And I actually ended up reaching out to the surgeon before intervening just to get a sense of what the anatomy was. He said he opened up her chest. He couldn't even do a lobectomy. It was just really necrotic, um, but he left her right upper lobes alone. And that's really what I was interested in finding out. Her post-operative course was quite complex and drawn out, including VV ECMO, she required renal replacement therapy, right chest decortication, and tracheostomy. This is all in 2015. And she was followed by one of our nearby hospitals, but not seen us till much more recently. In 2018, she experienced early tricuspid valve failure due to regurgitation. She underwent a valve and valve uh, transcatheter, that should say uh, uh, tricuspid valve repair, uh, rather replacement, not pulmonary with a 26 millimeter S3. And then by 2020, she really had manifested progressive exertional dyspnea. She was doing much worse clinically and echo evidence of significant RV dysfunction. She had actually been sent around to some other centers that turned her down for um, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy before making it to us. 
at that time, we performed a right heart catheterization. Her hemodynamics were widely abnormal, very elevated right-sided filling pressures, severe pulmonary hypertension with mean PA pressure 52, PBR of 11.3 wood units, and a cardiac index of 1.7. Um, this is what her initial angios that we took show. This is her, her right lung. You can see down in this region here, she's had uh, resection or really cautery of the right middle and lower lobes. There's nothing beyond this area right here. Um, but she does have uh, the A3, A3, A1 uh, segments completely occluded at their common orifice. And in her left PA, that's where she's receiving the majority of her flow. Um, but you can see a paucity of flow down in the left lower lobe. And when you look on lateral projections, you see a stump occlusion of what I have termed uh, the A9 and A10 supersegmental branch, I believe A7 and A8 to be coming off anteriorly. So she is receiving flow there. So we held a multidisciplinary conference about her um, as we do for all patients who we are considering balloon pulmonary angioplasty or surgery on, and she was turned down for surgery due to high operative risk, uh, as well as uh, we spent a significant amount of time discussing whether or not she would respond in a typical manner, manner to PTE because of alter, al altered tissue planes related to her underlying sepsis within these uh, thromboses. We also question the safety of BPA and the quality of the disease. Same sort of stuff. Is it calcified? Are we dealing with something that we understand? In the end, the decision really came down to the fact that she's a young patient with terrible disease and very, very minimal options. And her best long-term outcome is going to be with revascularization. And though this was considered quite high risk, after discussing with her and her mother, she was very enthusiastic about proceeding. Um, so in the first session that I brought her in for, and I'm going to sort of click through these, at first I'll show you some biplane images, which I think will be helpful, although I'll revert just to the AP images. You can see this is, this is the left pulmonary um, uh, lower lobe area, and here is this CTO of this common A9, A10. All right, there we go. And so what I start with is I usually move pretty rapidly now to wire escalation. Um, I, I had no chance of making uh, any kind of dent in, in this uh, occlusion with a standard workhorse wire. I usually typically use run-throughs or Xeon blues. And I try jacketed wires. And as soon as they deflect, I, I move pretty quickly from there. This is an Estado 40. Um, I started with a 20 and didn't get much, so I moved on with the Estado 40, which, you know, many regard as a spear, but I actually find it a very helpful tool. And you can see as I'm pushing it in, the, in, the entire catheter and the microcatheter through which it's housed, it's a Corsair, really jumps back. And I find I can only get decent penetration power with an Estado in these tougher to enter um, caps. Uh, and I'm moving sort of uh, I don't. I really don't know where I'm supposed to go. I'm just trying to enter into a, a tissue plane, and I'm moving anteriorly on the lateral camera, and posterior, and, and rather rightward on uh, the AP camera. And then you can see uh, I get into nowhere good, so I don't like that area. And I essentially take everything out and redirect. And then I take an injection. And I, I used to do this because I was worried about extravasation, and I I've really found that not even if a micro catheter crosses these proximal caps is any meaningful bleeding seen. And this patient didn't bleed at all here, but I take it more because just disturbing the cap, sometimes you can see where the vessel shows up and you, you do actually see that here. Um, in, in it's, it's moving much more posteriorly. So uh, I put a marker up on the top because this is what I've then used to try and figure out how to manipulate a wire into this location. And what you can see mainly from the lateral side here is that I do move posteriorly with this very stiff wire and I like that, but on AP, I'm not leftward, I'm rightward. So, you know, I wasn't sure where I was there. 
Um, and again, I take a picture, a microcatheter picture, and I find myself, despite not being exactly where I want it to be, I'm within the architecture of the vessel here. You can see that part of the vessel, uh, I'm in the subintima and it's filling the space, but there is drainage um, out into the uh, alveoli and the capillary bed just next door. So uh, I, I've reached some sort of vessel and then I proceed to go ahead and wire it. I think I end up losing my position a couple of times and have to rewire again with this very stiff wire um, before finding my way back in. And again, here's an injection uh, on the right-hand side. I've sort of moved over to the portion uh, of the talk where I'm only gonna show the APs. Um, and, and as I'm, I'm making my way and kind of losing my way, what I'm doing here on the left panel, let me pause the right one, is I'm injecting through the microcatheter. I find myself in the um, subintima and one of my methods is to pull back as I'm injecting because oftentimes I will find myself in the lumen more proximally. And if I can steady the microcatheter, I leave it there and then use a spring coil wire. I lost it here. So that's what happened there. I'm pulling back and it sprung on me. But I take a picture and I'm starting to get a sense of, of the branching vascular tree here. And, and now I'm feeling a little bit better about where I'm headed. I ended up rewiring this and you can see on the left panel, I've taken, this is a, this is a, I, I believe this is a Mongo wire. So it's a jacketed wire if I'm not mistaken. And I've knuckled and what I believe I've popped through in, in the coronary CTO world and probably call that star technique. And, and then I, I go ahead and when I've convinced myself I'm in a reasonable vascular space, I attempt to dilate this. And you can see it's very resistant disease, very uncommonly resistant. There's a really tight waist, but I end up making some headway here. And then you can see there's flow and I, it's not really clear the branch that I'm in with the wire, but I've opened up this arborizing branch just next door to it and spend some time doing progressive dilations in this area. And that's how I end that session. I just, I say it's good. It's probably been a few hours. I've opened up some territory in her and I'm feeling good that I walked away without any kind of injury. And I bring her back two weeks later for the second session. And in my first angiogram, I, I've already seen that things have started to open up on their own. And now again, uh, naming is, is one of the biggest challenges I have because until you see everything, it's hard to know. But again, calling this A10, I think you can appreciate now this A10 uh, region here. And then what I believe is the A9 region coming off, which, which is subtotaled now, not totaled, uh, but subtotaled. And it doesn't really look like healthy vasculature beyond. This is not what I experienced for most of my CTOs where you pop through that cap and everything looks beautiful. Those are very satisfying cases, but not for her. And I suspect that's because of the underlying infection. Um, and then I go to work to try and get into all of these areas. Here I am moving. This is a Xion wire, S-I-O-N, not the Xion blue, but the true Xion. I find these incredibly helpful to wind through tight spaces um, and that is a wire of choice when I'm dealing with these very tightly obstructed lesions, but I'm still trying to avoid uh, jacketed wires or the high uh, penetration force wires. I end up doing some ballooning out here and then a little bit higher balloon. And then this is the classic Steinberg pan out shot for, uh, which means bleeding. I got some bleeding and she actually has a moderate amount of hemoptysis here. And uh, I, I didn't include any angios, but you really can't appreciate any extravasation. And in fact, I don't, I'm not convinced it was my balloon, but more of my wire um, disrupting something below. I ended up balloon tamponading this. And, um, you know, despite being early in the course of this intervention and I try and push on, not for her, she, she's just too fragile. I ended up reversing her heparin and I terminated the procedure and really didn't get much work done on that um, on that second uh, intervention. I bring her back about a month later. Here we are again, 
you can see a bit better flow in this A9 segment. The vessels still look gross, for lack of a better word. You, you are seeing reasonable venous flow, but I'm just not happy with the way things look there. And I proceed to kind of intervene. I'm trying to get a little deeper. I really am trying to open up some of these sub large subsegmental branches. You can see here, and then she bleeds again. And I got a good amount of hemoptysis this time. I come close to intubating her, but she stops before I pull the trigger. And um, once again, able to manage this with balloon tamponade, heparin reversal, and then I terminate the procedure. So now a second procedure where I haven't really made much headway. And I, I begin to consider um, uh, that this, I have not actually approached this case as safely as I could, um, because if I need to selectively intubate her, her, her left lung is really doing all the heavy lifting here. She really has very limited perfusion in the right lung, really only A2 segment. And if we needed to do selective intubation, I mean, that's just not even possible here. And I, and I, I, I got concerned and I took a pause and I chatted with her again, very interested in moving forward despite these. And so I decided that even though the left lung doesn't look perfect, um, I, I'm gonna switch over and do the right upper lobe first, because if I can fight, if, if I injure that, at least we have the left lung and so on and so forth. So I bring her forwards for the fourth session. And here, here we see this um, truncus anteriosus uh, is fully occluded there. And I use a similar method here. Here I, in a Stato 20, I have a better angle at which to push my wire. I don't need quite the penetration force of a 40. And so you can see it, make some headway there. And then in this particular case, I, rather than an injection, um, I end up just swapping out for another Xion wire and I find myself in the lumen of the vessel. You can see it on the right, I just sort of twist around and find myself in a good spot and I feel pretty confident I'm there. So I go ahead and um, I balloon and then I get flow and I'm, I've found some of the architecture of these two segments. Um, this is likely the A1. Um, I, I go and I kind of sequentially wire these. These are four millimeter balloons. So far, I haven't shown you anything where I haven't been ballooning with a two or a four millimeter balloon, though I, I do go up to six and eights at some point um, in many of my cases. Um, and, and here is the result of that. I've started to get a few of the sub segmental A1 branches, but I'm missing A3, and I know about where it should come off. So I investigate, and that's what I'm doing here. Again, I find myself, this is probably the architecture of the vessel. And here you can see that method as I pull back. Sorry, these, these angios are a little bit small on the screen, but as I pull back, you can see some flow within the vessel itself, and I can redirect my wire. I finally make it to a place that I like. I want, and then I lose it. I can't remember what happened there. Didn't get to keep it. I ended up, oh. I wanted to go back there because, again, that's sort of the crux of my method here is to really pull back as as I'm as I've dissected into the vessel, I pull back, and there you can see a flash of of contrast entering in to the lumen of this vessel, and that's where I leave my microcatheter to continue to wire, which I end up doing. I balloon this, and then as I inject here, you can see part of this A3 branch light up and at the end of that intervention this is this is what it looks like from occlusion to the the large majority of these this a1 and this a3 i'm um, towards the end here uh realize is kind of a, a long case um she end up ends up undergoing two more sessions um and you know uh i touch up work, really getting in. Uh, I don't have any more issues with bleeding. And in the end, this is again, what her um, right upper lobe looks like. I've recruited most of these sub segments. And then this is what the, the left lower lobe branches that I opened up look like. She really doesn't have disease anywhere else, but in these locations. Um, and I mean, she just doesn't have normal looking left lower lobe vessels 
Um, and I would blame that all on in, the infectious etiology, except that you don't really see that in the right upper. They're fairly spared and act a little bit more like the CTOs I'm used to. Once you move beyond it, you really have a good vessel architecture. So I found this very interesting um, high risk case. It's doable, it, but it takes some time. Uh, there was definitely hand holding first me for the patient, then the patient had to hold my hand after the few bleeding episodes and, and we moved through together. But she had a pretty satisfactory result. Um, you know, uh, her her PA pressures, her mean PA pressures dropped from 52 to 27. Her right atrial pressure dropped from 27 to 10. Um, her wedge improved. Her index is not normal. It's one. It's only 2.0, but up from 1.7. But her PVR is substantially better at 5.4, down from 11.3. Um, she has not yet come back for three month hemodynamics. She is due back in one month. So it's a relatively recent case, but I, I thought it, it was an interesting one and one I hadn't seen before. I hope never to see one again. So um, that is what I got and I'd be happy to answer questions. I see some have built up. Um, so what size balloon am I using? So oftentimes, Two O's for distal, four O proximal, then I upsize six and even eight. Um, so uh, that's that's what I do. And, and I'm using Sterling's for the six and eight. In fact, I'd been using over the wires till recently, and then I switched to to the to the uh, monorail systems, which which has been an upgrade for me. I didn't actually realize they came in monorails, but they do. Um, and be happy to discuss any other elements about yeah, this. This is a fascinating case, Zach. You know, I think we're going to save the the nuances of this uh, for the last 15, 20 minutes. But uh, I, I was going to ask, so Vizam, do you want to show us something? Yeah, I have a quick case. Definitely Perfect. everything will yeah. look very mundane in front of uh, Zach's uh, case. <laughs> you want me to do it? Yeah, please. Thank you. Oh, wrong one. I don't know why I'm, uh, I don't know what you're seeing. Sorry, I'm having some difficulties here. It's sharing the wrong. Give me a second, please. All right, I should be good now. All right, you, you see it now, right? Yes, thank you. All right, so th this is this is more straightforward CTO, but uh, we'll just uh, go through it and I'll show you what technique I've used. 55 year old female, PE 20 years ago, chronic anticoagulation. She's had also a history of some drug abuse and she came in really with right heart failure, one year of progressive dyspnea and minimal exertion, ascites. She was told she has cirrhosis, which might be congestive, might be other things going on. So she was deemed not surgical candidate because of that. She has lower extremity edema, obviously. She was placed on diuretics and small improvement. Uh, creatinine increased a little bit after that. VQ scan, she had large bilateral lower lobe defects. On echo, her RV systolic pressure was 80. The RV was already failing. And on catheter, right pressure was high, mean PA was 57, wedge was fine, and her PVR measured at 12, which I would ex have expected it to be a little higher, but her cardiac index was not very bad. So this is her pulmonary angiogram that typically in our institution, our uh, pulmonary colleagues do them. Um, they do the workup and everything, and then they, they, uh, we run these cases, and, and then, and then the, they ask me to, to work on them if the surgeon turns them down. So. Um, this is her pulmonary angiogram, just a PA shot of the right and the left. And you can see that there are problems in a lot of different branches, but, but the, the majority of the issue is, is really occlusions, total occlusions in the lower lobes bilaterally. Um, to go straight to the, to the crux here, the long sheath, uh, multi-purpose guide that I placed here right into that RCA. This is, this I skipped the initial kind of diagnostic, but what I have here is a microcatheter trying to tackle this knob of the vessel. And it's really hard to tell what it's heading to. And I have a whisper wire that traveled a little bit in the lesion, which is actually pretty encouraging, but I'm not sure where it's heading. I have no idea. And I did not follow it with the microcatheter. I, I, 
I'm not, maybe not as, as courageous as following the uh, wire with the microcatheter and taking an injection. I'm afraid that the hole that the microcatheter is going to make might be too big. Uh, but I'm taking an injection, hoping that I'll see something there. And you can see that you don't see a lot of vessel downstream. So, and the wire wasn't progressing anyway. So I took a pilot 200. That's my second escalation there. And, and it did go further down. And, and I have a feeling with injections that, that I'm following a vascular structure. If you see, I'm already, the wire is already opening up some, some kind of like spiraling thing. It doesn't look like a bleeding. It looks more like a vessel. So I felt more courageous about sending more wire in and putting the microcatheter down. Notice that I also use biplane, like Dr. Steinberg. I, I, um, uh, it, it really helps me, helps me to helps me know where where I'm going. Where did it go? Okay, um, and um, you'll see here. I send the wide a little further down. Send the microcatheter, and now I'm injecting very beautiful vessels down there on both views. If you don't want to inject, another way, obviously, to know where you are is, is uh, workhorse wire. I believe this is um, either a Sion or most likely maybe a run through wire. And you can tell the wire behavior that you're in a vascular structure. So if you don't inject, if you just send the wire down, you, you can tell that a wire is not going to behave this way unless it's in a vascular structure. And ballooning afterwards and ended up with a big artery there. I still have a problem to what to do with these things. So there's a flap there, there's kind of like old tissue that's sitting in there, ballooning to big balloons up to 5.0, I believe in this case, multiple times. And I'm still unable to get to get rid of this. Even when, when I came back a month later, she still has something there. It was patent, but still had something there. And then I ballooned it again, it still looks this way. So I'm interested to hearing what, what uh, options, and what opinions you guys, you guys have on this. Um, this is her left. This is another session going on the left. You can tell that there's multiple occlusion in, in, in multiple segments and, and um, hard to tell, which is what I'm assuming, A10, A9 maybe. And um, in this case here, I'm just having a single projection on this side. Again, the microcatheter here, uh, turnpike, and then pilot 200 wouldn't go. Then I switched to Gaia third, which is my my escalation after the jacketed wires don't go. And, and you see how the Gaia third kind of made its way straight way down, looks promising. I, I, I kind of like saw Zach, you're talking about a stato that I have not used and I don't have as much experience, I guess, but uh, a stato will go straight, at least from my coronary experience and will look straight in, in outside the vessel because it's just a sphere that keeps going down. But other wires, including the Gaia third, will probably not have a nice, will not slide nicely like this unless it's in a vessel, but still it's not 100% guaranteed. And, but you know here that with the injection, I'm taking an injection with the one and notice that I have not advanced on my microcatheter yet. And I can see that I'm heading, if you, if you focus here, there's faint collateral filling here and I'm heading towards the collateral. So I know that I'm in, a, in, a, in the vessel there and I'm heading the right way and you can advance the wire there. Um, um, I took, a, I think that I advanced the microcatheter slightly, took a wire, and this is a workhorse wire. You can see how it's kind of beautifully kind of running in all branches, uh, taking an injection distally. The vessel is, is beautiful there. And then ballooning, and this is what I have here. And again, ballooning to big balloons here. Still doesn't look great, may need more work. So came back and worked on the, on the uh, posterior branch here, the A10, and uh, same technique, so I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. So same thing, I think a, a, a pilot 200 and then Gaia third I used and, and then microcatheter went through, buffed, injection looks good. And balloon both branches again, this is I believe a 5.0 or maybe a 6.0 balloon. And then balloon both branches again, and this is the final result there. You can see how the whole lobe uh, came back. And this is on the right is how we started. That's how we had like two occlusions down in these segments. And uh, she, she did really well there. Um, she didn't have any injury. I mean, I expected with, with her numbers being so high that CTOs should have injury. The guy I was doing at the same time, I'm not presenting now, but that same week had injury every time I opened up a CTO and I had to put him on, on high oxygen for that. And again, you see that, that even though came back for this, you see how it still has the stenosis here and it's probably always gonna look like this. And, and I don't know if, if there's any value in, in continuing to balloon these things. Um, this is after session five. She's had other sessions that I'm not showing where she did not have CTOs and she didn't have a dramatic response yet. Her mean PA pressure is 45 down from 57 and her PVR is eight down from 11, but she clinically is much better. She's off diuretics actually, she feels, she feels better.
All right, I'm going to stop sharing here and maybe we can kind of have discussion later. Yeah, wow, that was an incredible case. So I'm going to quickly show a case. So, you know, in all honesty, I was going to show a case of a successful BPA CTO, but then, so yesterday I ran into a complication. So I changed and I figured it would be good to share. Uh, it's something that I have not, you know, it's something that I've so dreaded for four years now of doing this. And yesterday was the day that I had to deal with this. So let me show everybody. I'm going to just so take everybody to the, oh, I have to share my screen, so. So, you know, so, so this is, oh, hold on, sorry. What's going on? Yeah, so, th so this is a 69 year old guy who had three vessel coronary disease and was initially being worked up for a cabbage. In the World Cup, he was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension and long story short, he was then diagnosed with so distal CTEF. Uh, and that's his speogram. I'm just focusing on the right lung and you will know why in a second. So that's the AP view of the right lung. Because uh, do, you mind, do you mind making the screen bigger? Sorry, yeah, yeah thank, you. thank you, thank okay. you. So, so that's the AP view of the right lung here. Uh, now, he, his hemodynamics are pretty advanced. He's got a PVR of about so 10, and the filling pressures were normal, but uh, the mean PA pressure is in the high 30s to early 40s. And that's his, his so disease here. I want to point this so right A10 so CTO out to everybody because that's what we attempted to treat yesterday all the way down here. Uh, so, you know, same thing, you know, long sheet, uh, long guide, uh, you know, a JR guide. I use a guideliner in a lot of these cases. I come in with a two over the wire balloon uh, to just, and, and with a workhorse wire uh, to just start and take a feel. And the workhorse wire actually goes, you know, so not without any, you know, so not with a lot of, so resistance. So now I'm here and I'm just taking a feel for the wire and trying to decide if I'm in a good place and I'll show. So I mag out to make sure that, so that was a 22 mag picture. I go out to 32 to just get a, you know, a, an idea of the landscape. I'm going to take you through the entire case. So I'm going to show you all the pictures so that, uh, so then uh, uh, the workhorse wires won't go any further than this. So I switched out the Xion Blue for a Fielder XT, thinking, you know, maybe I find a micro channel. And the Fielder XT actually flew by uh, and it so went down and it took a course. I pulled it back, I tried to navigate it and it, it, it was taking a J. So I thought I'm in a so blood vessel, so I felt it's so good about, I took a puff with a micro catheter and then I uh, so dilated it. That's a two or 20 balloon. Uh, I pulled the balloon back. I dilate the proximal part of the thing. Uh, then I take a picture and this is what I see. Uh, this is a two or balloon. I, as you can see, I pulled the wire back a bit because you know, first of all, it's a hydrophilic wire. And then I took a puff before this picture and I knew there was something going on here. But, uh, so, you know, so, you know, I'm sure people can appreciate. So there's a perforation here. Uh, and this is exactly where this wire tip was. The balloon never even so went there. So this is, uh, you know, this is a fielder XT uh, that was out here and, and there is a perf. Now the patient started coughing. He started having hemoptysis pretty instantaneously. So the next thing I did was I didn't want to lose access into this blood vessel because I was like, if I lose everything, so here I may not be even able to get back in there. So I got the wire down and I took a long 3O balloon and I essentially obstructed flow proximal to where I thought the perforation was. So if the perforation is coming from here, 
Uh, and this is a 32 magda picture. So I obstructed flow from here all the way up into the trunk here, make, you know, to just trying to stabilize. And we gave him sprotamine. Now, you know, the procedure had just started. So our ACT was only 220. We had only given the initial bolus of heparin. Uh, but up, so uh, essentially, I, after my balloon tamponade, he stopped having hemoptysis. He was feeling fine. So my usual protocol for such situations is that I would so sit there with the balloon inflated for about 10 minutes. And then I would bring the balloon down and take a puff again to see what I see. And until before, so this case, every time I've so done that, I, I have seen that there is no obvious extravasation, it stops uh, and the hemoptysis resolves. And then I come back and I fight this another day. In this case, after the balloon inflation, and it, 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 the other thing I did was I brought the guideliner down more selective, very near to the perf site, uh, and the pressure that was that that we are transducing from this guideliner is now pretty normal to what we are transducing up here. So I know the guideliner is in the blood vessels, but I really wanted to see if there is any leak going on here. So then I inject. And this is an impressive picture. You know, it's uh, the patient's having hemoptysis uh, and I, I'm so literally injecting contrast. Uh, so right where the puncture is, you know. So, all right, so what do I do next? You know, it's one of those moments that, oh crap. Uh, so I go and I bring the same 3 balloon down and I essentially take the guideliner back and I stamp on it. And the, thankfully, with the balloon inflated, the patient stabilizes, you know, we clear his mouth up, the blood pressure is good. The, the other key I thought was, the minute they start bleeding and they start coughing and hemoptysizing, the PA pressure shoots up. So you know, once you balloon tampon it, the PA pressure comes back to exactly where it is. So now I sat there for a good 30 minutes. Uh, we called for anesthesia at this point uh, because I was not gonna, you know, I was, I was anticipating the need for intubation and maybe so selective intubation in this case. So uh, give me one. It's hard to do webinars at 6 p.m. without hating kids, right? Exactly. Totally. I'm curious to hear what's everyone's setup for this, you know, um, to prepare for this type of complications. So, so I'm sorry, my son came in briefly. Don't worry. But, uh, so yeah, so I get the balloon up uh, and, and now I'm calling for anesthesia. And so, so while, so they're coming with the, so with all the stuff, including so the plan is to selectively intubate him in the in the left lung, do a bronchial blocker in the in the right A10 so segment so that if there is any blood that's still coming out, it doesn't so go elsewhere. So if you tell your anesthesia colleagues, you know it's something they can do easily. The right lower lobe is probably the easiest thing for them to bronchial block. That's what they tell me. So they come. So while they are coming, we come in from the left groin, the exact same system, and open it. So wire out here. We bring a long, a 770 sheet, a JR4 guide, and I get the open it wire down with the balloon inflated at all times so next to this balloon, and that's a lantern, so micro catheter. So you know, I'm not an expert coiler. You know, I have not had the privilege to do that too many times, but. So I have, exp I have, you know, I know how to use so one brand of coils. So I have those coils in the lab. So, you know, I use the Penumbra Ruby coils here and they work with the lantern catheter. So I park it there, patient stable, you know, totally fine, no problem. Uh, so we get the coil all deployed up to the, the tip of the catheter. At this point, he's intubated. We pull the balloon and the wire out and we start coiling. So I, I ended up putting so one pod and a 3 o a three by five and a three by 12. I wanted to pack it up all the way into, because at the end of the day, you have to close this branch completely. 
it's a subsegmental branch of the right lower lobe. So it's not a big branch in the first place. And then I want to show everybody this picture. I take a puff. This is the next one. Let me show this one. So then I take a puff and, you know, so you see this extravasation. So there was still some leak going on. Uh, and I just so waited for a, about 30 seconds and I took another picture and the leak was all gone. So it, it does take these coils a few seconds to work. Uh, you know, thankfully he stayed stable. He lost about one unit of blood total in all this exercise. And we kept him intubated overnight more just for precaution and safety. And he was extubated this morning. And, you know, we have him on IV heparin as a trial for 24 hours. Uh, it's all empiric. I'm, you know, I, we just want to, we just want to make sure that he has no other issues. Uh, and then he's going to go home. But I figured this was a, you know, it's it's just so one of those things that we dread all the time. Uh, but it did happen to me yesterday. Uh, I did also do a subtracted angiogram at the end because just to make sure there is no extravasation, no nothing still going on. Uh, so with that case, I'm going to stop sharing and then maybe we can all talk about, you know, we can have a discussion. Let's see what's happening on the Q&A box. If there's okay, nothing here. Okay, so I'm gonna first start with Zach. Yeah. Wow, so, uh, you know. I wanna start with you, Vikas. <laughs> You want to say, okay, sure. You yeah, I mean, you just show, that's, that's, uh, I've been there um, mm -hmm. a few times uh, and it's tough. I, I'd say first is that I, I, I have had ruptures from, a, from the hydrostatic force of injecting. And what I try not to do is if I have a leak, deeply engage and inject because I think mm -hmm. that yeah. made it I think yep. you can see it sort of like, oh, yeah, you're right. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and I think you got it. You know, it's, it's, it's that constant feeling like I got to take a look. If I don't take a look, I don't know what's going on. But in truth, you have a great sign. And that is, so when I have that, I also go up with a balloon. I hang out. If they're fine, maybe I go to the bathroom and get a cup of coffee. You know, I'll, I'll close this thing for a while and then let things down slowly and I don't look at all. I just sort of see if they're coughing. Are they still coughing? Are they still coughing? And eventually, I also feel compelled to look, but I pull my catheter way back. I, mean, I don't want to selectively intubate it at all, so the, the, the pressure has somewhere to go. And then see, I mean, if there's a big sinkhole, you're going to see the bleed. I don't think you have to see so much, but I think no hemoptysis really rules the day. And the second thing is, uh, my question to you is, once you, once you got that big bleed and you put the balloon back up, while you're waiting for intubation, was he still hemoptysizing or had he settled down? So he settled down. So that was the thing, you know, if, uh, if we get, if we got, it was pretty instantaneous. You, yeah. You, you balloon tamponade, you take a puff, make sure you're so balloon tamp. And, and you know, so what you said is a great, great point that I think the, the lesson I learned from this is you don't really, because I was expecting, so when I took that picture with a guideliner to not see anything and to see a beautiful open vessel because I saw excellent pressure. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh my God, I'm seeing really good PA pressure tracing. So now the hemoptysis, is, you know, the, the small perf has, had sealed. Yeah. So with the initial tamponade and that was not the case. I, I, I think you probably would have been all right without coil. It's hard to know. So hard to know when you're in the moment. But when if I can get balloon tamponade, I'm in a good position no matter what's happened below because I've never been in a situation. No, once I've been in a situation mm -hmm. where it did not um, it did not resolve and I had ruptured at the end of a, a smaller vessel with a small balloon mm -hmm. and I had to put a, no, an solution. Right. But if you get that, you have a lot of time to wait. And that's a big branch that you have to then coil occlude. Although if you were gonna do it, I do the exact same, my ping pong guides. I use vascular plugs because you put one or two and uh -huh. you're done. 
And so I think it probably makes sense to have some of those on your shelf. The ABP2 mm -hmm. will all go through six. Well, the most of the ones that you want to occlude with down lower down will go through a six branch, if not an eight branch, which you can just drop mm -hmm. in. So there's that. Um, but I would have innovated. I would have done all of that, but I would have really tried to leave it alone. And I've done that before and I've come back and they're always open. Like mm -hmm. you like somehow use up nicely. Even when I've exploded them and I have, mm -hmm. and they do heal up and you can get back in. So, you know, I, I, you got the patient out of the lab safely as a total success, but there, those are, I mean, uh, having done yeah. that before, those are kind of my couple of thoughts. Now, if you had that, the problem is when you go up on the balloon and now it doesn't stop bleeding because you have retrograde collaterals, like one of Wissam's examples yes. on the left, you could see retrograde collaterals coming up or sometimes you can't see them and they're bronchiolar circulation collaterals and then you're kind of in trouble. But um, if you can really get it to stop, I think you're, you're ahead. No, those are great points. Thank you for bringing all that up, Zach. Uh, so, so Vizam, do you have any questions for Zach for his wire choice or for my case? Uh, I was, yeah, I mean, this is it's it's very nice because I'm learning a lot from you guys, uh, your experience and everything. Uh, I was I was impressed to see a, a not not an a star of twenty and a star of forty kind of like accused in these. I mean that, but the the problem is obviously you don't have upstream support. It's not like with coronaries where you have like a guide sitting in the in the vessel. You're just kind of you from the from the air. You're just trying to kind of like poke a spear down at a, at a CTO and and. It, the 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 estado makes you lose the feel of the wire because you just kind of go in and it just follows where it goes. So, question for for Zai, you, you you do whatever your wire goes, you seem to be comfortable following with the microcatheter. Is that is that true? So you don't feel like the microcatheter will create a big burp. I don't, and I and I think that's a big point you're making because in the coronary space, I would never do that you punch a hole through the side of a coronary and you're in big trouble. I've, I've never found that to be the case in the PAs. I've been through the side of them with a microcatheter and they close up, especially if you're going first through a CTO because for, for, the, for the same issue you had in, in, in like that recoil of, of the disease in the right lower pulmonary artery, and that's what the disease does. It just wants to snap back in. You have to work really hard to fatigue it and break it. And so I just find it snaps back. If I put a balloon in, it's a different story. But if I don't, and I'm just going through the microcatheter, I've been in the pleura, and I say this with no ounce of pride, I've been in the bronchial circulation, I've been in the veins, and of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the alveoli, and it just closes up and people do okay. We took a while to get there and I would leave a wire across and I constantly take pictures. Is it flowing? Is it flowing? No, do I remove the wire? That's my safety net, is it? Am I just, and it just closes up. I don't have an issue. So I'm very quick to take a picture. I try not to use my estado too deep. And in this particular case, you were seeing it, but I wasn't just doing that. I'm showing you selected images a lot of what I'm doing is swapping out, taking an injection. The other thing I found is that if I'm injecting and I find myself in the uh, subintimal space, if I pull back and find myself in the lumen, it doesn't collapse what's going on distally. It's different than the coronaries in that way. And I've been able to wire spring coil wires and get them down. And then I never really see a consequence of it once the vessel's open. So I've gotten more and more comfortable. But you, the point you bring up is exactly why I use the Estado. It's not because I want to really jam something that I go straight and I feel nothing. It's because I push and everything springs back. And the only thing that will take the pressure from where I push it and transmit it all the way to the end is an Estado. So I'm not really getting the penetration power of 40 grams, or, but I am getting a straight forward push. And then by, and, and it does still want to track the vessel. You know, you can go out, but it really wants to stay in the vessel architecture. I think it really is happiest there, but I, then I do swap out and then I use wires either to knuckle or something like that. Oh, if, if, I'm sorry, you're going to say something, Vizal? Yeah, you've, you've shown also that you've been in a dissection flap, you've started down in the vessel. So if you feel like you've created the big dissection flap like that, do you just try to come back and use different wires to get in the true lumen or do you try to punch back from the dissection flap into true lumen by starting a knuckle? How, how do you guys do it? 
Yeah, so I started just really kind of moving off the CTO space in the coronaries, and, and we actually put out an initial publication about a year ago going through the different methods. I've done it by dissection reentry with a stingray balloon. I've done it by STAR. Um, I, I, I thought that I was onto something there and I, and I backed off. They're time consuming for really big branches or if it's like last remaining conduit, it's really worth putting the time in. But for the vast majority, you're putting in a lot of work and maybe you don't even become successful. The stingray balloons that I was using are for the coronaries. These are bigger PAs. It just felt like I proved I could do it, but I didn't feel like it was scalable or that I wanted to do it that often. And so what I started figuring out is that oftentimes as you just get through the cap, you get some visualization or somewhere you're in the lumen before you exit it. You don't just go straight into the subintima like you can with a coronary with lots of calcification. And that if I inject and I'm, I'm there, I, I pull back, you can see the problem is you, you can't control the pullback, but if you pull back, you pop in and most of the time you can see flow into the lumen somewhere, even if you're still within that thrombotic lesion or the scarred in lesion, there's something there that you can see flow. And then you can just wire it back. I mean, you can always get back in that sub space once you create that bore, but the idea is to, you know, Come a little proximal and then probe around with different wires till you find the the entrance. So that's what I'm doing almost exclusively now. To, it's much quicker, and I'm I have a good degree of success with that. It's mostly with the wire now, right? A wire ex, a wire escalation strategy, anti grade. Uh, yeah, once I'm through the cap, uh, yeah, it's it, it's really micro injection, and then depending on what I'm seeing, pull back and then wire with a spring coil if I can, or with a jacketed. I like knuckling them too. I find that that's really helpful. So I'm probably starring into some of them. They just pop through, but the knuckle I really like. And in fact, I do less angiograms now mm -hmm. when I knuckle it and I can tell how big my knuckle is and mm -hmm. I know the wire feels right. I just choose the right size balloon. And then I'll, yeah, you know, I'll, what you just said is the key for sure. Now I want to, ask, I want to ask Yulanka. She's been watching this super patiently. Uh, you know, I know, uh, you have a lot of experience with dealing with all kinds of vascular stuff. Uh, first of all, is there is there anything we can learn from your experience in the PAD world that we can translate into this space so that we can do this safely? You know that it's really interesting. I think one of the and learning seeing all of your all of you guys' cases is just amazing and like looking at your skill and how you guys manage with this different vasculature from one I'm definitely more used to. We're dealing more with peripheral CTOs, which typically depending on the the kind of the vas the, the actual segment, you know, commonly for you know SFA CTOs are the most difficult ones that we use and we generally use we tend to go you know, we've moved a lot from going for SFAs, doing uh, going subentimal and then re-entering and just yeah, using a hydrophilic wire uh, and just not cleaning it and be able to re-enter. That was kind of typically a lot of what we do. You know, then the one thing that we always have for peripherals that we don't have for pulmonary space is that we can get retrograde access. And, you know, whenever you get into a difficult situation, we can always get into that. But I think one of the... In terms of the complications, in terms of the perforations, I think that's something that's uh, very interesting in the way it's managed. The balloon tampon. I actually, we recently, we, I was dealing with actually a CFA uh, perf after arthrectomy, and it was, you know, just a balloon tampon and giving it time and waiting. Uh, it's one of the things that I think it's universal. It looks for all, uh, um, for all vascular beds overall. Um, and uh, I think typically I love the Esteto wire. Uh, personally, and I use it often to re-enter. Um, uh, between that and, and, and um, Connect to 50T as well, they're really good wires. And the Astato, as you mentioned, it, 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 want, it wants to follow this. So it, will, it will go anywhere. <laughs> it will go anywhere. But I think once you have, once you identify the structure where you want to go and you have a target of where you want to go when you want to head and you can feel where the, where the wire goes uh, and you can follow it, uh, and then exchange for your workhorse wire, uh, and then take a puff. I think it's a it's a really it's a really it's a technique that I use often when I have, for example, SFA pop CTOs, uh, and I'm in that space where I'm trying to re-enter from 
a pop to a tibial, uh, which is the most the very tricky situation because you want to make sure you're true lumen and you don't have a really wide dissection. Uh, so I think the from I think that scenario I think that's one of the things that uh, that is comparable to what uh, is done in the pulmonary CTOs. So Yolanka, you make a really good point about uh, 250T. So first of all, uh, congrats to the panel. I mean, the people in the audience, you know, these are varsity level cases. These are these are you're, you're going to have a, a few notches under your belt before you're going to try some of the stuff. So you know, they made they made it look like oh, you just do this and that, but it's it's pretty pretty tough. But my question to the panel is. You know, I also do do peripheral and, and and pulmonary. And so, you know, does anybody for the more proximal occlusions use an 018 system? Because the 250T is an 018 wire, it's not an 014 wire. Right? Like the Estado, the Estado comes in 018 and 014, um, depending on the tip load, and and or or even 035 system if it's very very proximal, like a truncus. So, does anybody use a uh, uh, you know go away from 014? I will be sure. I haven't. I just haven't had the guts to escalate to uh, you know to. Uh, so do anything more than 014, Zach, Wizam? I, I haven't, but that has to do with my both comfort level. I've never, I don't really ever touch an 018 wire for any reason. So it's not part of my standard armamentarium. And I, you, your point is well taken. I think, you know, you and Yolanka come from the peripheral world and this cross breeding is perfect. I come from the, actually the congenital world. I did both adult and pediatric interventional training. So for, for perfs, I'm very comfortable. I have tons of vascular plugs at my disposal. I come with sort of that. And I did coronary training, I mean, in Seattle with now my partner, Bill Lombardi. So I did all the CTO. We also have all this gear here just there for the taking. I didn't get any of this gear to do this. It was just like, what do I have on my shelf? but we don't have anyone who's doing peripheral. I will say that I did take a little bit of a dive in when I was sort of sorting out what was I gonna do when I got into the sub into mob before I realized that I didn't have to re-enter. And you guys have great gear. I looked at the Manta, was that gonna be better than the Stingray? And I also actually had someone come from the company to bring me an Outback. You guys know the Outback. I think I'm saying it right, the Outback as I recall. For those who don't know, it's great. You know, you, you push in this probe and then you you push out like a a, a, a hypodermic needle, kind of looking like that. It's hollow where you can wire, but you can also inject through there. And that's what I really love because imaging is so key. You can't see anything peripherally. You need to know where you're going before you put a balloon anywhere. And you could like puff, oh, I'm out of the vessel. I'm turned the wrong way. The problem is you can't advance this in there. You don't have any backup. You're going through turns in the heart before you get there. And I realized that it was too stiff a system. Could it be adapted? Sure. I don't ultimately think that may need to be the way to go, but you guys have such a wealth of other stuff and this cross-pollination and is, is like huge. So, so, so Zach, have you heard of the Pioneer? Yeah, so, that's yeah. what I was going to mention, Pioneer. Yeah. <laughs> that would be really useful because you can IBIS actually. I was, yeah, Pioneer is basically an IBIS and has a needle that you can actually, and, and you can actually visual, visualize where the true lumen is and you can re-enter. It's just beautiful. <laughs> the problem with that is, because I've tried, I mean, I can't, it's all collapsed below. So you don't really know. I don't know if you guys have tried to IBIS. I was all hot to trot on IBIS and then I realized, I couldn't tell what I was looking at. Where it's really hard to see. Like, you know, with peripheral, you're seeing calcium, you see where the vessel is, the walls. You don't see that in, in the, you just see kind of junk on the side sometimes. That's kind of like old clots organized and you don't, you can, you cannot tell what's what. I know it's, and then I thought, oh, maybe OCT, but the amount of contrast you'd have to inject to clear the blood pool. I've never even tried it. I quickly gave you know, up. So, so one last question for Vizam. You know, Vizam, you have, the most experience as an interventionalist than all of us combined here. And you are a guru in coronary intervention space for sure. You saw that space start, you know, in the in the in the in the mid 2000s to 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 where it is so right now. How do we so where do you see this going? You know, like because I can tell you, so six months ago, all the gurus of BPA were saying, don't do anything more than a workhorse. So why, right? Like, I think Zach was the first one to say, no, 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 you can use hydrophilic if you use it safely. Uh, and now we are attempting these pouches and these CTOs. So how do you see this, you know, this field's moving and how do we get this done? 
Yeah, thanks, because I'm not I'm not that old. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not... less experienced than you guys in the pulmonary BPA. Uh, <laughs> But I was there in the kind of like uh, late 2000s with the uh, CTO stuff. I mean, it's it, the, the, with the nice thing I think what helped me is, is the fact that I'm pretty comfortable with the CTO wires. And, and it's really, I think the people who were doing BPAs initially might not have been cross-pollinated with, with other techniques from other, like Zach here is describing his training with, with Bill Lombardi. And, and it's nice to have the other devices and actually have a good feel of what's a true lumen, what's a false lumen when the wire exits. The other thing are the coils. I'm very comfortable. I have all kinds of coils. I know exactly that my neural coils go through an 014 microcatheter. So a microcatheter there, I'm not like scrambling to know. So, so I have, I'm set up to, I'm not, I'm not super scared if I have a perf. I feel like I know how to manage it. I don't have that much experience with perfs in the pulmonary circulation, but I feel like I know how to coil and I know how to balloon tamponade. I know how to deal with protamine. I mean, all these things we've dealt with them in the coronary ward. And this thing is going to explode. I mean, now that we have people doing it that do other things at the same time, I think we're going to have better techniques. The only thing is that we don't have as many patients with the coronary ward, right? So the experience is not going to be as extensive. Which is going to keep industry from getting their hands into us, which would be nice because we have so much technology already there. It just needs to be adapted a little bit, I think. I want to show everybody the CME, the QR code for those who want to get CME credit, they can scan it in if this is your first time attending this. The link to, to make an account on the website is up there. Uh, and so with this, thank you. Thank you everybody for your time and showing the great cases. This will so live on YouTube on the Michigan Medicine PE Grand Rounds so channel. We'll share the link with everybody. Uh, if in future you talk to somebody who's interested in pulmonary artery CTOs, please feel free to share this, this link as a reference. And with that, thank you and have a good night. Take care. Thanks for getting thank us. Thank you. Great cases. Thank you. Thank you. Carol.